Good evening, everybody. Turn with me to Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Lord, we just thank you for everything, and we ask that you come down in a powerful way, and just encourage and anoint, and make your, li your word alive tonight to us as we partake of it. We just thank you for everybody that's here. We ask a blessing upon their lives. And we just say this in your name. Amen. Now we're looking at Romans uh, 9 through 11, the chapters, because what we have is sort of a past history of Israel, the present reality of Israel, and the future promise of Israel. And we see it in these three chapters. Apostle Paul is very clear about his commitment to the nation of Israel that he was willing to go to hell for the nation if they would be saved. But you see, Jesus already, as their king, went to the cross. And uh, he also went to the grave for them and even preached to the captives in hell. He went all the way. Now, nothing else can be done can't be done for you, can't be done for a blind nation, it can't be done. He already secured it all. He said it's finished on the cross. How many times have we said that, but how many believe that? How many believe that there's more work to be done? Well, I'm sure there's more work uh, to be done in your life by the Holy Spirit, but there's not any work that you can do other than to submit, give way, and obey. And that's about all you can do. And it's not work. It's a, it's a reasonable service. It's an honor. It's a privilege. It is because of love. Uh, it's all for the right reasons. Now, it's up to individuals to believe. That is the bottom line, to believe, whether you're, you're uh, a Jew or a Gentile. It's up to you individually to believe. And so we see people coming out of nations and out of people and believing. They come out and they're separate and they become part of the church. Now, in due time, though, know this, the nation of Israel will be humble enough to receive the Messiah one of these days. And this humility for the nation will come with a great price. Of course, you can read it if you want to, Zechariah 13, 8, and 9. I'm not going to have you turn there, but basically what it says is that two-thirds of the Israel nation will perish. Only a third will come through the fires, and they will come through the refining process and of that of gold and silver. And this is going to be quite a process for them because when they come out, they will not only know who their Messiah is, but they reflect him. And so there's a lot that's going on right now. Uh, so in Romans 9, you know, there was that great debate how God could elect such a nation. <laughs> how could you elect Israel? But it's God's sovereign right to choose whosoever he wants to choose, people. It's not up to us to tell him how to do his business. After all, God is the potter. And guess what? We're the clay, whether we like it or not. Now, we can be stiff-necked, and that just means our process is going to get pretty hard on us. Uh, whether it's being left out in the weather more, whether it's being pounded on the wheel more, whether the heat gets a little intense, it's, just, it's still going to come down to us as to how much of a process we're going to have to go through because he has to make us pliable. He has to make our neck willing to bend, our knees willing to bend, our heart willing to be open. And as long as we're independent and self-willed and self-stiff neck, he's going to take us through the process and we can get mad, we can scream, I've done it. I was, I'm a spoiled, rotten American and I've had fits with him. And he says, well, go ahead, it's not going to change what I need to do in you. 
And so it's all about what he wants to do in you. doesn't matter what your plans are. Yeah, you can push him back. You don't have to go along with the plans. You can make it harder on yourself, but you're going to miss a lot in the process. And I know as one person, I would not want to miss the incredible experiences I had with God because he took me through the process and I allowed him to. I did not act like a great person in that process. Sometimes I was just, I would have taken me over my knee more once and spanked me a big time, and a couple of times he did. But this is how God is. He's taken us through a process. He has a right to choose who he will. He exalts who he so wills. He will bring down who he so wills. And this is not just individuals, this nation's people. He uses all his vessels and some as vessels of honor and some as uh, dishonor. But you know what we are in his hands? We're putty. You know what nations are in his hands? They're putty. And to think anything else is to not be realistic with God at all. He can do whatever he wants with you. But he wants the best for us. But we have a tendency to say, God, unless it's my terms, my way, I don't believe you want the best for me because I know what's best for me. No, you don't. You have no clue. And you know why we don't know what's best for us? Because we're selfish. And to know what's best for us means we have to know what's right for others. Because if we're pushing our way on to others, we're going to find ourselves in the middle of tons of conflict. So he is all, he's talking about the fact that he uses um, circumstances, situations to bless, to test, and to judge his people. So in Romans 10, he talks about the zeal that the Israels had towards the Lord. After all, salvation is of the Jews. That's what John 4.22 says. Now, what they had was the law. And they felt sufficient enough, the Jews, in their own strength and piousness to keep it. But what they failed to see, and we can't emphasize this enough, is into the glory of the law. To see beyond it, to see holiness that would undo them no matter how wonderful they thought they were. I'm here to tell you, you stand in the holiness of God, it's going to undo you. There's not going to be a lot left standing when it gets done with you. You're going to stand just as, as poor Isaiah. I mean, here was a righteous man in his own way, but he says, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a man of people of unclean lips. And so you will sense your patheticness in God's holiness, and people don't want to feel that way. They don't want to feel bad. They don't want to, you know. And so they don't want to look into the glory of the law because they'd have to look at the holiness of God and know that they were totally undone before God over it. Now the glory of the Lord reveals that no man can keep the law, really, the principle of the law. They, they, they can't keep the principle of law. If man trespass the law by treading contrary to it or breaking it, by knowingly doing wrong or showing contempt and mockery, please hear me. When you choose to disobey what you know is right, you're showing contempt and mockery towards what God has ordained as being sacred. That's very, that's very serious. I remember this very much because as I was reading about David and what he did with Bathsheba, the term that was used by the prophet with David is that you disdained his, his, com his commandments. That's how God looked at it. And so uh, there's this attitude that you have when you go into disobedience that shows contempt or mockery towards what God has ordained to be acceptable to him. Now, if you have broken uh, the point of the law, uh, if you've broken the law at one point, you have broken the whole law according to James 2.10. 
So what the problem was for the Jews is they had a zeal of God according to their knowledge of the law, but they were ignorant as to what constituted righteousness. Today, if you really ask me what's wrong with the church, they have all these standards, all these doctrines, but they're ignorant as to what constitutes true righteousness before God. It comes back to something called faith. Now, we use the word a lot. We can talk about it. But how many really walk by faith? As believers, we know that what's at the end of the law, the glory of the law, is Christ himself. He's the one that basically satisfied the law. He satisfied it on our behalf. Now, Moses, when he was given the law, could only ascribe to obeying the law as being a point of righteousness. But it wasn't the point of righteousness. Because you have to ask, what happened before Moses, before the law? How was righteousness determined then? Well, it comes down simple. What did Abraham live by? He lived by faith, not the law. And that's what we're supposed to do. And that's what the Jewish people failed to understand. They were to live by faith not by the law. Out of faith, they would be obedient, they would do what's right, but they would be living by faith. For them, keeping the law was a duty, but to God, because of their attitude, it became useless, because there was no faith in it. So what is not of faith, and that's in Romans 14, 23, is sin. We are justified by faith that believes. By faith we stand on a matter because it's true. Because of faith, we believe that what God says is also true. Because he never lies. So that's all a matter of faith. Now we can talk about it, but how many of you found yourself questioning everything you believed at one point in your life? Do I really have faith? No, you don't. What you have to understand is God gives you a measure of faith as you decide, I'm going to choose to trust God. That's when he gives you the measure of faith. And that's when you come to a place of rest with God and his word. So no man can bring the Lord down to his way of doing and make it acceptable or raise up Christ and resurrection power to overcome the enemies of the soul. What God is trying to show you and I and Paul trying to show you and I and we hear it all the time, but we got to get it. Only God can save you. Only God can save you. This all points to the gospel, which is the power of God and the salvation. Jesus dying for our sins, silencing the old man in the grave, and raising three days later to prove victorious over death. So now we come to Romans 10, 9, and 10. How many times have we quoted that, right? That if thou confess. Now, if means it's optional. You can bow out, you can reject it, you can not go there. If you will but confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. We have to think about that title, Lord Jesus. I talked about it in depth because we talk about an intellectual salvation and not a revelation of salvation by the heart. There has to be a point where you sort of recognize Jesus for who he is. He is Lord. Now, living in our culture today, we don't understand Lord and servant. Really, we don't. We see it on TV, maybe, but we don't understand. Because we have enough independence in America to say, I'm Lord, and I'll decide when and how I serve God. If Jesus is really Lord of your life, he's the one that calls all the shots. You don't call any of them. 
You are his servants. You have been bought with a price. The Bible tells us that. But we independent Americans, we pick and choose how, when we're going to serve God. And we throw crumbs at God and say, God, I'm your servant. And God thinks, well, I don't think you know what it means. Because you wouldn't be dictating to me. I would be instructing you to go here, do this, and you would be doing it if you were really my servant. How many of us, I'm sure none of us are guilty, have debated with God about what we're going to do? Well, Lord, <laughs> I have. Does that make me a true servant? No. What, what you have to understand is we are servants in disposition. You're going to serve something. You, you've got to get that in your head. Oh, no, I'm not serving anything. Yes, you are. You're serving something. It could be the old man. It could be your pride. It could be uh, the God of this age, which is Satan. It could be something, but you're serving something. We are slaves. The beauty about receiving Christ is we can choose who, we, who our master is. If you are not born again, guess what? You have the same master. His name is Satan. And he may be ruling you through the, to, through the pride, through the flesh, through the eyes, but he's ruling you. You're, you're serving him in some way. But we are born again so we can choose our master. And hopefully, if you're truly born again, you will choose only one master. That's the Lord Jesus. So the confession is a, is a legal binding contract. Because if you know anything about servants, they were bought. There's a binding contract that went on in the marketplaces of Rome over servants. And they bought it. They, were, they paid for it. They were given papers for that servant. A lot of times, if you even study our history here in America, they were given papers for servants. That was their possession. And so uh, we have a seal, and that's the Holy Spirit. But the question is, are you serving the Lord? Are you picking this and choosing what you're going to do for the Lord, when you're going to do it? Well, when I darn well please to do it, I'll do it. It doesn't work that way. And so... Paul is really bringing this relationship out in a powerful way. He wants us to get it. If you're going to be saved, there has to be a binding contract where you confess that Jesus is Lord. We're going to get into that a little bit more before it's over with. He is Lord. Now, there's something I want you to understand about this whole situation. Because if you understand the Jewish approach to things, if something was established as being from God, that was enough for them. But for the Gentiles, it was what position you held. So anytime you look at Paul's letters to the Gentile, he begins with his position because his position is that of authority. To the Jews, all authority came from God. So if he was ordaining it, then they could accept it. So I want you to think about what Paul is doing here. He's satisfying both. Because Jesus' Lord points to deity. So right there, the Jews are saying, that's my authority. But Lord is a title. And so it's saying to uh, the Gentiles, he's Lord of his household. He has the authority. And so by saying, when you confess Jesus is Lord, Jesus, you know, it's Lord. He's saying, you're satisfying both the Jews' requirement to accept that authority, that contract, and the Gentiles' requirement. It's quite an incredible thing. And so when you look at Lord Jesus, 
Jesus is his mission. He came to save. So when I listen to people to say, well, I have accepted Jesus, and they use two terms, as Lord and Savior. What is Jesus telling you? He is Savior. Jehovah is your salvation. So every time they say, I've received Christ as my Lord and Savior, they're coming back in a sense right back to what uh, Paul said in Romans 10, 9 and 10. Confess him as Lord Jesus. Your Lord and Savior. So there's a lot in this. And not only are you recognizing that he has this authority and power to save you, and that's what he came to do, but you're believing in your heart that God verified it by raising him from the grave. That's the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. He goes on to say, of course, in verse 10, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. People, if your heart isn't in a matter, you're not truly converted. If your heart's not in a matter, you're not really going to have the conviction to do anything. And so it has to be a heart revelation, not just a mental understanding, the heart revelation. This is so, this is true. I've entered into this relationship with my creator I've acknowledged that this is the only way I'm going to get saved I want to be saved so Paul is laying all of this out so Paul is establishing the authority for both the Jew and the Gentile in order to confirm that one can believe the truth as a matter of good faith when I believe something, it's out of good faith. When I respond to something, it's because of the other person's good faith towards me. You have to understand that. Every time you obey, you are showing what? Your good faith towards God, who is already showing his faith, good faith towards you by offering you and providing the way of salvation. It's all a matter of this contract that we have entered in. As Lord, he is our owner. His name is clearest to his mission of salvation. And Paul is laying it out there so we can trust it is so. We need to believe in our heart that God established the way of salvation. We need to start preaching the gospel. The full, complete gospel. Not a little wimpy presentation. We've got to explain people what it really means to be saved. One of my favorite stories is of Richard Mahalski, who was a, he's gone home to be with the Lord. He was a powerful missionary, and it was after the Iron Curtain came down, and he went into this prison to preach. And he said there was about 2,500 people. It was a pretty big prison. I think that's how many he said it was. But anyway, he began to preach. And, and when he came down to the end, he says, Okay, if there's anybody who wants to receive Christ, raise your hands. He said, You know, I really didn't give God very much credit. He said, Because every hand but six raised to receive Christ. He said, Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Put your hands down. So they put their hands down. He said, I really want you to understand the cost of being a Christian. That to be saved, you have to understand there's a cost. There's a point of denial. There's a point of the cross. And he goes on, and so he sort of lays it out there, the cost of Christianity. He thought, now I'm sure that all these people, more and more people, will be weeded out. And he says, whoever now wants to receive Christ, raise your hand. Stand up. He said, everyone, including the guards, stood up. See, that's the power of the gospel. 
It reaches into the greatest place of darkness. Because of why? Because of who Jesus is and what he did for you on the cross. There is nothing else that reaches man in his darkness and in his soul as that message. It is hope. So Paul is establishing this authority and the, re and the proof is in the resurrection of Jesus himself. So it begins with confessing Jesus and guess what? It ends with what? If thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and at the end it says, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And he begins with Jesus, and he ends with Jesus. And in between is an incredible revelation of what Christ did. And that he was raised up from the grave to bring it about. Now, he explains how this confession is made in good faith. I want you to look at verse 11 with me. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Why not believe in him? We have to look at these words. They're small words. We just take it for granted. Why on him? instead of in him. Because what you're doing when you believe on him is you're placing all of your confidence on him. And when you believe in him, you're placing yourself in him. And so you are placing everything on who Jesus is. You're going to rest on that. You're going to walk on that. You're, it's going to be your foundation. You're going to believe on him. And if you do, guess what? You're never going to be ashamed. You know why a lot of people stop from going all the way? They're afraid they're going to be ashamed. They're, going to be, they're afraid they're going to be made fun of. And then the people are going to be right. They're afraid of this. They're afraid of that. You know what their problem is? Unbelief. That's all it is. They will not choose to put their faith on. So they can walk in that faith in Christ. They don't trust his character. They don't trust what he says. And they will not place all their confidence on him. That's so. That's what faith is. I place my confidence on him. He says you'll never be ashamed for believing. You'll never be ashamed. You'll never be caught there looking stupid or foolish or dumb because you believed. Because he's going to confirm your faith wherever you turn. And you believe on him. And you believe on his word. And you walk in it. You will never be ashamed. I can tell you there's times that my human nature gets in there. And I get a little afraid. And I get embarrassed. I get that. Hey, we all have those moments. But the beauty about me is I have this evangelist that doesn't matter where she is. Well, two of them. But especially one has been at it for a lot of years. And she goes in there and she parts the Red Sea. Oh, thank you, Jeanette. Thank you, Carrie. I don't have to part the Red Sea. You just did it. And they do that. I'm a different evangelist. I like to sit and talk with people, find out where they're at. They go in with the, <clears throat> the gospel. And yes, you do occasionally. I do it at school. Yes. Okay. Anyway, but that is the reality of evangelists. Okay, I am not the out front person. Jeanette will find the smallest crack. Mm -hmm. To me, it's so minute you'd have to get out of them some kind of magnifying glass. 
but she sees it and she runs through it. I've seen her do it time and time again. Every day almost. And you never know. I mean, some of the things that happens just sort of shocks me. I'm like, oh, okay, Jeanette, okay, okay, okay. But again, I'm the one that likes to sit down and talk to people. I want to see where they're at. I want to see where I can uh, bring in the reality of Christ. If they're open. We just have different evangelistic ways and her way is her way and my way is the way that God has made me comfortable with. You have to find that in yourself. You have to find that balance in your own life. How you can walk in and be prepared. That's the key. Are you willing to share the gospel? Then avail yourself to share the gospel gospel and then ask the Lord to bring people into your midst to share the gospel and then look for them because he's going to bring them that's what you have to understand that's why Jer Jeanette carries all of these uh, tra chick tracks with her oh here's one she'll hand them to the kids when they walk through here's one and they love reading those chick tracks uh, they may laugh at them but they love it Shh. We had this kid back in Nampa. He was trying to stand, uh, start a van cl cl vampire club and going to cause all kinds of chaos and everything. His parents brought him there. We prayed with him. But Jeanette had these chick tracks, and he would take him to school. And we're talking about people ready to get in, in, in um, the call, all kinds of things. And they would take turns reading it. They would mock it, but they'd read it. They couldn't help themselves but read it. He would come back and tell us, you know, they all read that track, and they mocked it and laughed at it, but they read it. Mm -hmm. And they read it all the way through. We never know the seeds that are planted. It's not up to us to worry about where the seeds are planted. We have to just be available to plant them when the opportunity comes. Now let's look at verse 12. It says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all them, all that call upon him. Now, he's saying here that anybody can come to him. A Jew, the Greek, they all can come to him. He's available to all who will call upon him. Again, we're talking about will call on him. And then rest in that once they receive that as being so so think about that for a minute between the Jew and the Greek the same Lord there's no difference how he saves any of us he saves all of us the same way it's the same way people believe receive An open heart call he will hear you. For he's the same Lord over all. The same Lord. He's the owner and possessor of all things over all of us. He is rich. We become rich because of him. One of the, uh, the favorite scriptures I used to read uh, is found in 2 Corinthians. I'm sure most of you know it. 8. I read this every once in a while. I don't hear the scripture very often. I used to hear it all the time when I was first saved. They go to the scripture, but I don't hear it very often. But let's look at it. For we, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, remember, he, he had everything, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his Poverty, I didn't even get that, thank you, might be rich. He became poor so you could be rich. He became sin so you could be made in the righteousness of God. He took your place. So why do we live like a bunch of heathens, beggars, spiritual paupers in the world today, when in Christ we have it all? 
Why do we sell for all this patheticness around us when we have been seated in high places with Christ? That's something we have to ask ourselves. James 2.5 says that what he wants us to be rich in is, his, is faith. Faith. It's all about having that faith. This is why the next scripture is so powerful. He is leading up to this scripture. He's leading up to it. What is he leading up to? Verse 13 in Romans 10. For whosoever shall call upon there we go, placing everything in him so we can rest in all that he's promised us. Up on who? The Lord, the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Now I want you to think about this for a moment, because I studied this. We're, again, we're talking about that we're calling up on him because he's trustworthy. We're placing everything on him. We're going to walk it out because of him. But how many do you think have called upon him? Now the word call means to invoke. For aid, worship, testimony, decision, etc. To appeal unto. To call upon, it points to exaltation, and it implies coming to rest on something. When you call upon the Lord, you're calling, up, you're calling on the one who has authority, the one who is trustworthy, the one who can be believed. In fact, you're going to rest everything on it. So how many people are recorded in the Bible as calling upon the name of the Lord? I want you to know I didn't get all of them. I just got a few. But I'm going to give you examples. What about that Hagar? Did you know she called upon the name of the Lord in Genesis 16, 10 through 12? And you know what she, she received? She received the promise of a son. Could she rest upon that? You bet. She went back and submitted to Sarah and had a son. Now she called upon the Lord. And he said, you will have a son. What about Abraham in Genesis 21:33? He planted a grove and he called up on the name of the Lord. And I love what he said, who is everlasting. Do you think he was disappointed for resting in the Lord's promises, even though he didn't even see his son for 25 years, that promise being fulfilled, you think he still rested everything on God. You bet he did. He rested on his promises. Why? Because God is everlasting. And he doesn't forget. What about Isaac? He called upon the name of the Lord after pitching his tent and building an altar in Genesis 26. When, when someone pitches a tent, he's going to abide there until he hears an answer. And an altar is a place where you always meet God. It's where you commit, you sacrifice, you make, uh, you make different uh, vows to, to God. And so he built this altar and he cried unto the Lord. What happened with him? Well, God promised him the promises of Abraham, his father Abraham. And guess what? He gave him peace with his en enemies. Look about, think about Elisha. Who did he call upon when he was at Mount Carmel? He called upon the name of the Lord. You know, the thing I love about him is that he knew God would accept his sacrifice, but to make a real impression, he poured water on that sacrifice. 
dumped tons of water on it. And you know, you see, fire, when fire comes down on the sacrifice, it means God approves of it and accepts it. Elijah was making it hard for God to accept his sacrifice, to consume it. But what did he say? That fire came now, took up the water, took, consumed the sacrifice, and it showed that God approved of it. Something to think about. Do you have that kind of faith? You take the sacrifice, you put it on the altar. It says put fire there, not water. But you say, Lord, this is what you've required. And I'm going to put water on it. I'm going to trust you with it. And I'm going to trust you're going to accept it because you required it. And you deserve it. How many of you remember the Gentile Naaman? He was told to go dip himself in the Jordan River twice and to call upon the name of the Lord. What happened to that guy? He was healed. Are we not being healed today because we're really not calling upon the name of the Lord? Because when you call upon the name of the Lord, you have to be willing to respond. You have to do what he tells you to do. And, oh, yeah, I'll call upon the name of the Lord. Okay, this is what I want you to do. Oh, forget that. I'm sure you're not asking me to do that, Lord. Just blew it. We are told that God quickens those who call up on his precious name in faith. He quickens you. Do you need to be quickened? Now, we have many promises attached to those who call upon the name of the Lord in simple faith. And when they come to rest on his abiding promises... They can because of who he is. And we know according to Hebrews eleven six, no one can please God without faith. However, I want you to consider Asaph's request to the Lord. I thought this was so interesting when I was doing this study. study. Look at Psalm 79, 6. It's sort of an amazing thing. I looked at that and thought, wow, what a man. Uh, that he would say that to the Lord, what he requested. So I wanted to take note of it. Let me get there. 79. 6. Now look at what he says. Pour out thy wrath upon the heathen that have not known thee, and upon the kingdoms. Now notice the last part of that, that have not called upon thy name. Wow. That's serious business. So how important is it for you to call upon the name of the Lord? That guy said, Asap, pour your wrath on them if the nations who do not call upon How glorious is the name, the Lord Jesus. It's glorious because of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. How far reaching his name is. Heaven responds. Hell shakes. The wicked tremble. And the evil hide. And it's all because of something that was said. We all know it. It's found in Philippians 2. Turn there with me. Philippians 2. We're going to read verses you've read many times, and I hope this strikes you deeper than before after hearing this. Beginning in verse 9. Wherefore, God also has highly exalted him, meaning Jesus, and given him a name 
which is what? Above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should what? Confess that Jesus is what? Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, what it's saying, people, is that the prerequisite to, prerequisite to salvation is confessing Jesus as Lord. I'm here to tell you, if you don't do it now, you're going to do it. You're going to do it. Because why? He is Lord. He is Lord over all. Not just a few over all. He's an owner, possessor of all. And one day, every wicked person, every despot, every tyrant, everybody that shook their fist at God, everybody that worshiped Satan, every demon in hell is going to bow their knee. And they will do nothing else but what they're told to do and what they know they need to do. They need to declare that Jesus, the Christ, is Lord. So do we. But is it a term or is he Lord? If you are saved, it's because you called upon the name of the Lord. And now... You rest in his glorious promises of hope, life, and eternal glory.